Uh, with that said, let's start chapter 11. Um, so connective tissues of a muscle. If you look at the muscle, we have uh, we went over this a little bit in class before the break and all this stuff happened, but a little bit of review. Um, there's a couple layers of the muscle. You have the endomyosin, um, which wraps the cell. You have the perimyosin, which wraps the fascicle. You have the epimyosin, which wraps the entire muscle. And then you have fascia that wraps the muscle group. Now this fascia right here, I think I mentioned in class, is like saran wrap. You know, you try to, the saran wrap gets all these wrinkles and you try to straighten it out, straighten it out, but eventually it just starts to wrinkle again. And that's why stretching sometimes, you stretch and you stretch and you stretch, but you're always tight. And that's because if you look at this, you can never physiologically add more sarcomeres or muscle fibers. You're always gonna be tight. Uh, um, and that's just the way, that's genetic, that's the way you're born. But we can stretch to give us temporary relief, and that's why foam rolling or stretching does give us temporary relief. Neuromuscularly, the brain relaxes for uh, a temporary time. That could be half hour, it could be an hour. Um, but next day you wake up, you're tight again, so you have to stretch again. So it's a temporary relief. But it does allow us to uh, continue with our activity and run and play sports uh, without injury. Now, there's different kinds of muscles. There's different kinds of shapes. Uh, obviously, you have the fusiform muscles, which are thick in the middle, uh, tapered at the ends. And I'll give you examples of this in the next slides. You have parallel muscles, which are uniform width. Uh, the fascicles are aligned. You have triangular, which are convergent muscles. They're broad at one end and narrow at another. Um, you have pennate muscles, which are feather shaped. And then you have circular muscles, which are little sphincters. And uh, they form rings around body openings. So you'll have sphincters around the eye, the mouth, and the anus. So here's the classification of muscles. You have a fusiform, parallel, triangular, unipennate, bipennate, multipennate, and circular. So some examples of fusiform are the biceps. Parallel, there's rectus. Triangular is pectoralis major. Palmaris interossei. Your quads are bipennate. Your deltoid is multipennate. And then here's those little sphincters. Orbicularis oculi, this is around your eye, but then you have orbicularis oris around your mouth. Okay. So here's the parallel muscles. Here's Ritic Roshan. Uh, it's got some pretty good parallel flat muscles right here. Okay. <coughs> You've got fusiform muscles, which are your biceps right here. Okay, so you see some good biceps, which has a tendon, a belly, and another tendon right here. Now remember, tendons attach muscle to bone and ligaments attach bone to bone. Then you got triangular muscle. This is Arnold Schwarzenegger, was our governor, but this is triangular broad on one side and then narrow on another side. Obviously, all these guys are doing a little bit of supplementation. I don't know about this. Uh, he says he doesn't do any, uh, but I don't know. Um, he's definitely doing some supplementation, and in his autobiography, he definitely did uh, steroids for sure. Um, muscle groups and compartments. So compartments uh, are spaces enclosed by fascia called intramuscular septa. Uh, each compartment, one or more functionally related muscles, you have a whole bunch of nerves and blood vessels in there and you have them in your upper limbs and lower limbs. And the reason that the body is divided into compartments, so if there's an injury, they can compartmentalize basically and hopefully limit the destruction or injury to one area. Um, so you have upper limbs and lower limbs. Now, if you look at this compartment right here, you have an anterior compartment. So let's say you just have an injury to this. Hopefully you can just keep it within that. You have a lateral compartment and then you have a posterior compartment. Obviously, injuries happen, um, and I'm going to show you uh, the next slide is a little graphic, uh, so if you don't like to see it, then uh, turn away. Um, but here's compartmental syndromes that you'll see. Yes, ouch, 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 ouch. So this is the thigh, okay? This is compartmental syndrome of the thigh. This is compartmental syndrome of the lower leg, and this is compartmental syndrome of the forearm. 
So what happens is obviously there was an injury and blood vessels break and the body will try to just keep it in this compartment. The problem is if it continues to bleed, continues to bleed, it will cut off circulation to this and you could pretty much lose your arm. So basically they basically open it up, lay it open, let all the blood seep out basically and then hopefully it can repair it back. Um, this is an interesting one right here. Uh, this reminds me of my uh, college roommate that he got kneed in the uh, thigh. And I can't remember if I told you this story in class, but he got kneed in the thigh playing basketball. And then that night it just started to balloon up and just get, because he had, they had broken a blood vessel, but his leg started to hurt. So he took him to the ER and they basically had to open it up and let it bleed out. If he didn't go to the ER, he probably would have lost his leg. So crazy stuff. All right, so muscle attachments, um, you have direct fleshy attachment, you have a close association with bone, um, connection with collagen fibers. You have an indirect attachment, uh, and that's your tendon attaches muscle to bone, uh, connects to the periosteum and the matrix. Sometimes you have an aponeurosis, which is a broad sheet of uh, uh, tendon, like your palmaris longus has a palmar aponeurosis. Uh, can attach tissues other than bone, such as the dermis of the skin, since sometimes you have muscles that attach just to the skin. Um, so <laughs> while you were studying, obviously, uh, origin, structurally, the proximal attachment of a muscle or the part of the attaches closest to the midline or center of the body. Okay, so that's the origin. Functionally and historically, the least movable part attachment of the muscle. So the origin stays fixed and the insertion will move towards the origin here. So this is the origin of the biceps and the insertion will move towards it. So here's the insertion. Structurally, the distal attachment, so the one furthest away that touches furthest from the midline or center of the body. Uh, functionally and historically, the most movable part. So the insertion will move closer to the origin. So if you look at this biceps femoris, the origin is the ischial tuberosity. And the insertion is head of the fibula. So when you bend your knee, the insertion will go towards the origin here. Uh, there's intrinsics and extrinsic muscles. Intrinsics, they both have their origin insertion contained within a particular region. And then extrinsic acts upon a designated region but has its origin elsewhere. Um, so those could be your forearm muscles um, that originate at uh, the elbow, but they do have movements at the hand. But then intrinsics, you have uh, muscles in your palm themselves and your foot that stay within that region. So that's the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, action, well, the mus muscles uh, produced an action, like the biceps, they bend your elbow. The quadriceps, they extend your knee. And you have a prime mover, which is the agonist. So for knee extension, your prime mover is your quadriceps. Your antagonist for knee extension will be your hamstrings. Okay. And then sometimes you have a synergist, which will aid the prime mover. So let's take your biceps, for example. Uh, your biceps is an agonist that will bend your elbow. But your synergist will be also brachialis, which will help that movement. And the fixator prevents the bone movement. So there are a couple of fixators that we'll go over. Um, your body is all pulleys and levers. That's all it is. It's all efficient and it's either a first class lever, a second class lever, or a third class lever. And levers add speed, distance, and force of motion. The lever is usually your bone. The fulcrum is your joint. And the effort is from the muscle. So that's very important for you to understand. So your body is made up of letter, le levers. They're either first, second, or third class. And don't worry, I have examples. And the fulcrum is usually the joint, the lever is usually the bone, and the effort is from the muscle. So depending on where the joint is, depending on where the muscle is, it depends on how efficient that is. And you'll have a mechanical advantage. Length of the effort arm, okay, divided by length of the resistance arm. So I'll give you some examples here so it makes sense here. So let's look at uh, first class lever. That's fulcrum in the middle. You have a seesaw extending of the neck that's a first class lever okay second class lever resistance in the middle lifting a wheelbarrow if you know what a wheel uh, barrow is you know it's very easy to lift a lot of weight uh, bouncing a child on the knee that's very easy to do even though they weigh 20 30 pounds because that's a second class lever but a third class lever the efforts in the middle like paddling a canoe you know that's kind of a, a, a 
hard to do, and then flexing the elbow. So doing bicep curls is actually a third class lever. It's not very efficient, so it's difficult to do. So here's some examples of a first class lever. A seesaw is a first class lever. Okay, a second class lever is a wheelbarrow, but also if you look at bouncing a child on your knee, that's a second class lever. And then paddling is a third class lever, whereas that's the biceps. So of all these, the most efficient is the wheelbarrow and the gastroc is another example. These are not very efficient, so that's why you know your neck can fatigue very quickly, your neck muscle, that's why you get some neck pain. And really, to really tax your biceps, you have to work hard at the gym. So if you go to the gym, most of our body is either a first or a third class lever. So not very efficient, meaning you have to lift a lot of weight to get some good results. That's why leg day, people don't like leg day because legs are a lot, they're usually first or third class lever. So you have to lift a lot of weight to get results. Um, here's some real life examples. Uh, the nutcracker, it's pretty easy to do that. That's a second class lever, but real life, a hammer trying to get that nail out, that's a first class lever. Scissors are a first class lever. Uh, third class levers are a broom, um, some tweezers, and fishing is a third class lever. Okay, what do you think this corona? It's corona time. You think it's first uh, class lever, second class lever, or third class lever? Well, a bottle opener, remember, you don't have to put a lot of effort, so you can open that, so that's a second class lever. So a bottle opener would be a second class lever. Now, how are muscles named? Um, they're named for different reasons. You have a size, for example, brevis means short. Uh, teres means round. Um, brachii means arm, so if you have biceps, which means two heads, brachii means arm, so a biceps brachii is found in the arm. Uh, rectus means straight, so rectus abdominis, that's straight muscle near your abdomen. And then you have a flexor, a muscle that flexes. So you have a flexor carpi ulnaris. So it flexes carpi, the hand, and ulnaris is on the ulnar side. Uh, muscle innervation, describe which nerve stimulates the muscle. Spinal nerves arise from the spinal cord and innervate muscles below the neck. Uh, cranial nerves emerge from the brainstem and innervate muscles of the head and neck. So your cranial nerves will do the head and neck, and then you have spinal nerves that uh, will innervate um, your peripheral muscles. So biceps tendon or biceps brachii, for example, is innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve, which you have studied. So that's why I like to give the OIN before. So when you do this lecture, it's not foreign to you. You've heard it before. So now you're hearing it again so that it'll stick in your brain a little bit better, I hope. Um, strategies to learn muscle anatomy, repetition, examine models, uh, palpate and exercise your muscles, find origin insertions on a skeleton, uh, say muscle names out loud. I'm sure you might, we'll, we'll make it out, but stay, stay in your house and do the best you can. So here's the muscles. You have to know all these muscles. Yes, 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 yes. So just to kind of point out, here's the orbicularis oculi. Here's the pletsma, deltoid, pectoralis major. Here's the biceps, uh, brachioradialis. Here's your abs. You have external obliques, you have internal obliques, transverse abdominis. So if you take your transverse, take your belly button and suck in your belly button towards your spine, and that's your transverse abdominis, okay? You've got your quads here, rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, sartorius is here. And if you go into the lower, you have tibialis anterior and gastroc. Now, if you think about this, we, as we're sitting at the computer, all these muscles will become tight in the front. All these muscles in the back become lengthened and weak. So when you go to the gym, and right now the gyms are closed, so you're gonna have to devise a way to work out at home, all these become weak. So the posterior chain, all the muscles in the back are the ones that you wanna always emphasize. So always emphasize the glutes. You're sitting on your butt right now, so it's becoming weak. So try to find exercises to emphasize glute max. Your lats, your traps, your posterior deltoids, your rhomboids, getting your shoulders back, your hamstrings, and your gastroc. I want you to work all these posterior chain muscles. That will give you a good workout. We t tend to emphasize the beach muscles, which are you know your chest, your biceps, and quads. 
and your abs, but then you kind of get this hunched over look. So you want to make sure that you're exercising all the back muscles, such as your glutes. And the glutes are important, hamstrings and your back. Okay. Now, 